Hello, Grace Point family. Good to have you again here on Wednesday night. What? He's got his Bible up. My Bible. So now I'll start over. Thanks for interrupting. <sighs> Hello, Grace Point family. Welcome back to another Wednesday night midweek Bible study. Thursday night, Wednesday night, whatever night you're watching this. It's Tuesday night for us, so uh, we're just going to jump right into Romans chapter 11 here in just a little bit. want to spend a little time in prayer um, for any requests that we've got. And again, if you have requests, make sure you drop them in the comments there, and, and Marsh and I will be praying for those. Anyone else who sees those on uh, our social media sites, they'll, be, they'll know to pray as well. Um, but we're just we're glad to, to be able to communicate this way with you guys and hope you're getting something out of this study from Romans. Uh, it's been really good, and so uh, we're just excited to keep going. I want to thank Marcy for covering for me last week, and she did a great job on teaching about peace, which is uh, just a huge need in our in our day and age uh, as we live right now in the in the way that the world is going. And I know that uh, there's a lot of confusion out there. There's a lot of uncertainty, and so we want to make sure we continue to pray for not just our communities, but our world, our our leaders, um, and, and just to know that that no matter what's going on, God God's got us right. Like. Even the worst could happen, and we're still in the palm of his hand. Um, and there's a lot of comfort to me in that, and I hope there's a lot of comfort for you in that as well, uh, to know that, that our Creator God uh, loves us so much that even if our life here on earth ends, we get to spend eternity with him in heaven. Like that's, I was listening to something just today, and it, it talked about how how small we will view our life. Like when you think back to uh, to day 17 of your kindergarten year, right? You literally, it doesn't mean anything, right? You can't look. After 10,000 years in heaven, we look back on the year 2020, it's going to be like nothing. Like, yeah, I think something crazy happened then, but I, I've been in heaven for 10,000 years. Like that's that's how much God loves us. That he, he's, got, he's got a future for us. He's got a hope for us, a living hope that we have hope right now while we're alive. It's with us. And All right, so I'm getting, getting off course, but I, I want to pray for us. I want to pray for our country, our churches, uh, the people of our church, and, and just to know that, that we've, got, um, we've got a hope that this world needs to see right now. So I want to encourage us that way. So let's pray, and then we'll, we'll jump in. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this day. I thank you for the beauty um, that has just become tonight after the rain uh, that we just had all day. It's just beautiful out there right now, and, and your creation is shining. It's, it's glistening, Father God, and it's just so beautiful to know that you, you have implemented all of those things, the rain, the storms, um, the sunlight. All of that is part of your grand design, and it works together just so beautifully. And the same thing is, is true for us in our lives, not just even in our own physical bodies, the way everything works together, but in our relationships with others and with you, Heavenly Father, everything works when we follow your plan. And God, our, our world right now needs to follow your plan. We need to love each other better. We need to take care of each other better. We need to recognize where we fall short in areas, Father God, to confess those things to you and to live in such a way that pleases you and shines your light to everyone that we come in contact with, Father God. So I just pray for that right now over our, our churches, our people, that they would that they would just want to be the light of Jesus Christ wherever they go. God, would you be with the, the prayer requests that we have in our in our Bloomfield campus specifically, Father? I think of, of Barbara Hurd, who is going in for surgery in a couple of days. I pray that she'll just keep her uh, strong, keep her body strong, and be with her mentally as she's preparing for this surgery. Uh, and, and with the with the way the rules are right now, she can't have um, her her entire family there with her, and that's that's weighing heavily on her heart. Father God, would you just just bring her peace of mind uh, into that situation, God? Father, would you be with just a couple of unspoken requests that we have from people, uh, whether there's there's a job situation and there's another uh, a family relationship issue that's going on, Father God? I pray that you would just touch that right now, that you were, your hands would be um, at work in the lives of those families. Father God, and that, that you'll get the glory from this, that they'll, they'll continue to trust and seek after you. Father God, we love you so much, and I thank you for what you're doing in our churches. Just continue to bless, Father God, as we follow after you in everything that we do. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, again, we just thank you for this beautiful day that you've given to us, and 
Lord, we just pray. We just thank you for the many blessings that you've given to us in this day. And Lord, we pray um, for some of the requests here in Sheraton um, for Charlotte, that the physical therapy is going well. Um, we continue to pray for Connie and her family um, as they're going, still, you know, dealing with the loss of Bob. And Lord, we just we just pray for those in our church and um, would you just continue to give comfort to them and just continue to to show them that you're right there with them through all of this and and that you you're not leaving them that you're right there with them lord we just thank you that you give that security that you're you're right there with us through everything and lord i just thank you for that i just pray that you continue to open up our hearts and our mind to the me the message that you want us to learn from tonight and lord i just thank you that we have this opportunity to come and to learn more about you and that you reveal yourself in the word mm -hmm. lord we just thank you we love you we ask these things in jesus name amen amen, amen. okay so we're gonna get just a little over halfway through Romans uh, chapter 11 tonight. Um, it's kind of a longer chapter, so we're trying to break it up, um, but we're kind of, um, he's kind of got three sections of it, so it's kind of three separate s thoughts, so we're going to get kind of through the first section and uh, into the second section. Um, so if you watch tonight, you've got to watch next week to finish this up. <laughs> <laughs> or if you watch next week, you've got to wa go back, back to watch, and watch yeah. this one. So um, anyway, I wanted to kind of start us out with um, this thought that N.T. Wright had in his um, Bible study or his studies over Romans in chapter 11. And so he kind of brought up this thought of, and um, I don't know if you've, I'm pretty sure it's in those Western themes themed movies where it's like this town isn't big enough for the both of us and so he says that that's kind of where Paul is 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 how he's talking to the Jews and the Gentiles because they both have this attitude of you know or the Jews think this town isn't big enough for the two of us you know and so Paul is kind of bringing this in and saying actually it is yeah. <laughs> and yeah. so, you know, that's kind of where Paul's coming from in this. And I thought that was kind of a neat idea that he brought to the table, you know, that that idea of this town isn't the big enough for the two of us. I, I have you well, <laughs> I've, I've never heard of it put that way about Paul, but, you know, Paul, who was Saul, who wanted to persecute, you know, all the all the Christians, whether they were whether they were Jews who were deciding to follow after Jesus or they were the Gentiles, he wanted to persecute them all. Uh, and so for him to switch gears so heavily, like just and, I, and and it wasn't immediate. It took, I mean, his Damascus Road experience was definitely immediate, um, but it took him three years of studying to really get to where he he understood what Jesus was wanting him to do. But it was so dramatic of a change that only God could do that, mm -hmm. right? Only God could do a change like that in a man's heart. And so that that's you know talk about hope that gives us hope for the world in which we live today. Where you know we see we see a lot of hatred and division, um, we've got to know that that God is God's got God's got room for everybody. Absolutely, that's good. I like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, so Romans eleven. So the first ten verses kind of summarize chapters nine and ten. So he kind of comes around and brings this into a closing almost. Mm -hmm. um, and w it leads into his argument that's in the latter part of chapter 11, so something that we'll kind of get into um, next week. Uh, Paul is making the point that Gentiles and Jews will be saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Mm -hmm. I just really liked how uh, Great House put that. Saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Now, I'm sure it's been put that way in, you know, different different readings. So, but it just like. Yeah, I mean, and that's and and you, you get into the Greek way of, of whether these these letters were written originally, and and Paul uses those, and other other writers of the New Testament use these, you know, language, you know, kind of. Um, you know, like the word alone over and over and over again, or, you know, you come with rhyming schemes or you come with just, you know, these alliterations that just mm -hmm. really catches the ear of the person listening or reading, you know. And so, yeah, the way that, that he writes that 
saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Like there is nothing else but Jesus, mm -hmm. right? There's nothing else. And so that's, it, it really drives that point home. Mm -hmm. and, that's, and it's necessary because in our humanness, we like to add, mm -hmm. you know, what if I just, what if I could do it this way? Right, I, my four-year-old all the time is trying to come up with a different way than I said to do it, because he's human, and we want to figure it out ourselves. And we want to do it our way, and we no Jesus and nothing else. So that can be a good. It's a really good thing. Like it's just Jesus. Like nothing that I can do. I can't. I can't do anything. It's all Jesus. And then, yet, I have this desire to to make it my own, right? And so it's it's good to recognize that it's it really is just that. So I, I do, I agree. I like the way he puts that. Mm -hmm. So um, Romans 11 is broken up, and it's probably about the same way that it is in, in your Bible. But the first section, so verses 10, or 1 through 10, is Paul is talking about the faithful remnant of Israel. And verses 11 through 24, he talks about the fall of Israel, which opened doors to allow Gentiles in. And then verses 25 through 36, he's talking about, or through 32, um, sorry, before he gets into that, into that last part. Um, so 25 through 32, all believing Gentiles and Jews will be saved. So that's kind of the breakdown of what they're kind of talking about in each of the sections here in Romans. Um, so let's go ahead and read verses 1 through 10. I apologize. I didn't bring my Bible, so I have to use my phone. Uh, I ask then, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know what Scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he appealed to God against Israel? Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I am the only one left, and they are trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. What then? What the people of Israel sought so earnestly, they did not obtain. The elect among them did, but the others were hardened, as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that could not see, and ears that could not hear, to this very day. And David says, May their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. May their eyes be darkened so they cannot see, and their backs be bent forever. Hmm. There's a lot there. <laughs> um, so first of all, I want to point out there, and you can kind of get it from the reading, but I just wanted to make sure we pointed that out, where Paul says, did God reject his people? And so in that, it's he's talking about Israel. So did God reject Israel? And he says, by no means. And he points out there, I am an Israelite myself and a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. Um, but I wanted to point out there that when he says his people, you know. Yep. So then um, in verse 2, uh, God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know what scripture says in the passage of Elijah? how he appealed to God against Israel. And so um, another thing that Great House put in just an awesome way that I couldn't find any other way to say it, but he said over this verse, he said, Israel is both smaller and larger than most Jews imagined. You have to explain that one to me. I'm not sure. So, like, he's, he's bringing to um, that there's this, because the Israel, the Jews thought that that um, Israel, so his his people, um, were just the Jews, mm -hmm. and so Paul is bringing this. Nope, this is reimagined. So his people are are reimagined. Um, so it's 
bringing this, uh, the Gentiles into this yeah, fold. Right. And so it's, you know, he, he says there, Israel is both smaller and larger than most Jews imagine. So the Jews kind of imagined just, you know, just their them, mm -hmm. just the ones that could. The ones of Jewish descent. Yes, Just yes. bloodline yes. from Abraham. And so um, he, Paul is in this in this in this section of Romans, trying to say Israel's not just of Jewish descent. Mm -hmm. Israel is all of this. Yeah. You know, through Christ, uh, we're all his people. Yeah. Um, and then I wanted to point out there, too, in verse 5. Um, so, too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And so that's kind of where th we get that, what I talked about earlier, verses 1 through 10, uh, Paul's talking about the faithful remnant of Israel. So those in Israel um, that have come to the conclusion that they believe in Christ. Um, and then, let's see, verse 6. In if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. And so, once again, you know, Paul's getting back into that grace versus works conversation um, that he we've already gone through, and we're not going <laughs> to go back through that again anymore, other than I wanted to just uh, pull up a few quotes here out of the, um, the commentary. Uh, that Israel's election is on the basis of grace contr contributes to Paul's emerging definition of Israel. So that's kind of links back to that um, Israel is both smaller and larger than most Jews imagined. Um, because Paul's emerging this definition of Israel in this, in this part. And it's a, a, another quote he goes on just a little bit later to say about this verse is, Grace is not about what humans can do without God. Gentiles do not have to become Jews or adopt their customs or rituals to be part of the grace-defined election community. And so I thought that was really good. Uh, grace is not about what humans can do without God. Yeah, I think because grace is a gift from God, um, and what, what it doesn't even it doesn't even give us like extra abilities, right? It, it literally is just God's adoption of us into His family, is what that's the, what the grace is there to do to forgive us of our sins, to adopt us in as His family, to regenerate us, to justify us. Mm -hmm. All of that grace of salvation that's leading to sanctification, holiness. Um, and all that's a gift from God. Like we can't, we can't do that without Him. And so, I, yeah, I agree with that completely. Um, and then, so no, we don't have to become Jewish because that's God's chosen people. Because through Christ, God has chosen everybody. Mm -hmm. And so we can we can live our lives. We can live in our culture. We can live in our um, understanding of the world. As we, as our eyes are opened up and enlightened by the Word of God and through the power of the Holy Spirit in us, mm -hmm. that's good. And so, yeah, and we join the family, mm -hmm. the elected, the elect. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah, yeah. I just, I thought, you know, that was like it. We're once again coming back, you know, to that grace versus works conversation um, that Paul's getting into with them, and he's saying, you know, like it just it really has nothing to do with what you have done. Mm -hmm. It's grace. And I that's yeah, I agree with you. I, I just I love the the free the the way that I love this under our Wesleyan understanding of election, mm -hmm. right? Like, I, and I love this. You said this is from Great House. The mm -hmm. um, to be a part of the grace defined election community. Mm -hmm. Like the way that other denominations teach about the elect is that you're either you either are or you're not. Right. And so like there's that's a that's there's a harshness there. Even if you even if you think you're one of the ones that are in, like, how do you look on the people that you determine are not? Mm -hmm. Right. And who are we to determine that anyways? But if we can if we understand this rightly, I believe this is rightly understood 
that we can become a part of the elect as we live in the grace that is freely given to everybody. We just have to accept it. If we accept that grace, we're welcomed into the elect. That's mm-hmm. that's beautiful to me. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, well, and so right there in verse 7, we do talk about, and he says right there, um, the elect among them. Um, and so I was going to bring up there um, that when we s- when he says there in verse seven, the elect among among them, he's saying the justified believers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's not like th- like you said, you know, like some people believe about the elect. Um, Paul's talking about the justified believers yeah, there. That's good. Um, and so I uh, just to kind of skip back to the first part of that verse. Uh, So, once again, Paul's leading us up with the question, what then? And so he answers it, uh, what the people of Israel sought so earnestly. um, And so he said that it's kind of this, they, in the NIV it says sought so earnestly, but it's kind of this this wished for, hoped for, uh, that they did not attain. The justified believers among them did. And then it says, but the others were hardened. And um, there's a little bit of argument there on whether the ar- the others were hopelessly lost or not hopelessly lost. And we kind of, through Paul's writing, he's kind of showing us that he didn't believe that the others that were hardened are hopelessly lost mm-hmm. there. Um, and then, you know, he... Uh, Oh, and I wanted to bring up this uh, this other quote that was out of the commentary um, by Barrett. Uh, he brought this quote. He said, their religious enthusiasm was turned to sin. Hmm. And so I wanted to kind of, you know, their religious enthusiasm was turned to sin. So it's kind of going back to that what Paul had talked about, their zealousness. So when you can have zeal in the right way or the wrong way. And so it was like their zealousness went the wrong direction. Sure. Yeah, I think it's, you know, you're talking about hopelessly lost, you know, and then those that are hardened, you know, their their zeal is taking them in the wrong direction because they would still call themselves Jews. They would still call themselves children of God. And yet they're not justified. They are not believing in the grace of Jesus Christ. They are trying to earn their way in or buy their way in or, or however their mind is thinking through this. And so are they hopelessly lost? I don't know. But uh, well, here's what I tell you. If, if you've gotten to the point where your heart is being hardened by your belief in your wrong belief, man, that makes it difficult <laughs> to get back to where God wants you to be. And the reality is if you if you are someone whose heart has been hardened, it's going to take a deep breaking of your heart to get to get that hope restored. Right? So are people hopelessly lost? No. Uh, until until we are dead and face our judgment, we're we're not hopelessly lost. Jesus still has a way in, but the harder your heart becomes, God can't just mold your heart anymore, right? So I know I'm getting a deep kind of like analogies here, but, you know, he's molding that clay, and if the clay is soft and it's malleable and it's moldable, it's so easy to form for God to form us into who he wants us to be. But if our heart is hard and he can't shape us because of that hardened heart, out comes the chisel, right? And to, to be able to break us so that he can then have his chance to shape us again into who he wants us to be. So if, if your heart's hard today, don't don't give up hope. Just, just know that <laughs> the reality is there's probably going to be some pain if you're going to get back to where God wants you to be. And that's okay. Like that's, I think, if, I, if there was one big thing I would take away from that it's okay to be broken right some of us are hardened because of things that we've done uh, and, and then many others are hardened because of things that have happened to them and God still has to break their heart so he can 
mold that person into who he wants them to be. So if you if you sense that in yourself, let God break you, right? There's pain, but that's what the church family's for. That's what that's what we're here for. That's what you, let let lean on lean on people, lean on God, because I guarantee you He will not break your heart just to leave you broken. He breaks our hearts, and then He puts us back together in the way that He wants us to be put back. So. Yeah. Well, it's just kind of um, what, when you were talking, it kind of reminded me of the conversations we've had. I, I'm sure it's come up in. I know it's come up in some of my sermons, and I know it's probably come up in yours as well. But like that, that growth, like there has to be that death for the growth, mm -hmm. and we have to die to ourselves. And sometimes that dying, that pain, is that death. Like to to for our hard heart to be broken away, and that pain is that that death. And there's pain in death, no matter what. Like there's that pain. And so just to be able to let go of, you know, it's like what we want um, to allow God to take our hearts and form it what it is that he wants. Yeah, I think un unfortunately we don't hear that phrase much anymore, dying to yourself, like literally like giving up who you are. And again, in, in our today's world, that's a tough conversation to have. But giving up who you are so that God can put Jesus inside of you and live that out. And I don't think we lose our personality in that. I don't think we lose um, who he created us to be in that. We lose or we give up, more accurately, we give up who we think we should be, mm -hmm. right? And so he's just, so that dying to self actually corrects our thinking. It, it corrects our, our, our processing ability of what's happening around us, what's happening to us, what's happening to our family members. Like it, it helps us understand that it's not, it's not what we think. It's what God is wanting to do and shape us and mold us. And when we see it from that perspective, we absolutely can, can be changed, mm -hmm. right? And so that's, I think that's a big deal. And, that, and you talk about growth, you know, and dying is a part of the growth process. Mm -hmm. But then, and even just, again, to, to mix analogies or mix metaphors, Growing pains is, is a very real thing, right? Some people experience more than others, but when you grow, your muscles break down and they, they have to be built back up. And that's body, you know, weightlifters, um, bodybuilders. They're breaking down their muscles so that they can grow back stronger. But there is pain in that for sure. And so I think that's, that's, a, that's really good. Um, I think it's, we have to understand that like breaking our hearts, growth, Dying to ourselves, there's absolutely pain involved in the process. But God is with us every step of the way. Our church family is with us every step of the way, and we can hold on to those things. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, and that whole conversation reminds me of a conversation that I just had with uh, David yesterday morning. Um, so as many of you might know, um, we still own our house in Ottawa, but it's uh, in the process of being sold. And so he was very upset about not being able to, you know, mm. about leaving the house. And I said, well, David, I said, sometimes we've got to let go of things that, you know, we really thought we, you know, we obviously love that house. And we've had a lot of good memories there. I go, sometimes we've got to let go in order to move into what God wants us mm. to, to move into. And I said, you know, we've had more opportunities in this house. I said, you've been able to ride a bike, um, which is something you weren't able to do in the, in the old house, um, just because of it being on a hill and mm -hmm. logistics of that. Yeah. And I said, we spend more time in the backyard and in the yard here than we ever did, um, you know, in our house in, in Atoma because it was right downtown. It was right. right in the action of things. There were people that were out and about that maybe didn't use the best language. <laughs> <laughs> and so we didn't spend as much time outside. And here it's really that beautiful. And I said, you know, I know it's hard to leave that house, but, you know, God has already given us so many gifts um, in this. And I think sometimes, you know, we get to that point where we go, we don't want to leave this part, and mm. we don't want to, we don't want to give up this part. Uh, we don't want to let God shape our heart 
you know, we kind of, but what's next? Well, we sometimes we just have to let go and trust and know that God is mm-hmm. going to bring us into this beautiful thing. He's it's just going to be more beautiful than we could ever imagine. And the more we tend to do that, the more we're going to trust that no matter what the situation looks like, I'm going to let go and just let God have it. And he's going to bring me through that. And it's going to be even more beautiful on the other side than I could ever imagine. Amen. Amen. Oh, so <laughs> that was a good conversation. Yeah. <laughs> so um, there, let's see, where were we at? Okay, so there in line, um, he's bringing up this, you know, uh, he says, may their table. Um, and so when we think about their table, uh, so may their table become a snare and a trap. Um, he's bringing up this clean and unclean foods. Um, when he says their table, um, you know, because in the Jewish tradition, there was the clean and the unclean foods. Um, but really kind of the thing that he's talking about are these issues that divide. Um, so may the issues that divide become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block, and an, a, a retribution for them. And uh, so the stumbling bo- block, uh, their stumble led to the death of Christ, but the death of Christ led to the Gentiles being grafted in. And that's kind of where he goes later in this. Um, but he's saying, you know, their stumbling block. And, you know, just to kind of get into a little bit more of my my notes, I'm kind of jumping ahead. But there's just that stumbling block. Like that stumbling block was never meant for their their fall to be fatal. Mm-hmm. And so it was just something th- they were supposed to, you know, well, they just stumbled over it. And it wasn't supposed to take them down. <laughs> right. um, and so that's, you know, when we're talking about that, that's kind of what, you know, their stumbling block and the retribution for them. So, um, yeah, that's what I have. God didn't intend Israel's misstep over Christ to be a fatal fall. Yeah, I think that's good to understand. Like, you know, he doesn't, he didn't want the, the Jews to, he wasn't, he wasn't switching out, you know, his chosen people for, for the Gentiles to take the place of the Jews. This was, this is, as you said in a couple of verses, we're gonna, he grafted them in. And so Jews are at her still, you know, and we, we have a lot of, it becomes more, it's become more of a political thing now. We're like, are we, is Israel our ally because we're a Christian nation? And so Israel's always been our ally because it's the people of God. And so we have a lot of Christians that say the America should always have Israel as an ally. And, and, and I don't know where I fall on that. I don't know if that's hugely important to this discussion, but it, but it is very true that God still loves the Israelites. The Jews that, that still reject Jesus as the Messiah, God still longs to have a relationship with them. And so this stumbling block, I mean, sometimes, I, you know, I can be <coughs> mowing my yard. In the backyard of my house in Bloomfield, there is a massive tree, right? And every storm, we lose another branch, and we lose little branches all the time. And so I'm mowing the grass, and, and, and I like to keep my grass uh, a little taller than most people, right? Uh, I think it feels better on your feet. I think it looks better. I don't like going scorched earth on my grass, so don't anyone get, like, send me nasty emails or anything like that. But if you mow your grass too short, it's ugly. Don't do it. Okay. So I like a little taller. So what happens sometimes is the sticks, I don't see them, right? I try to go around, and I pick up the sticks, and, you know, the big logs, I can see. I can cut them up. I throw them in the fire. But there's these little sticks, and so I could stumble over one of those sticks, and I have. And then there's root systems that are coming up, and I stumble over those. What does that do, though? It brings light to what's going on in that spot, right? So, oh, there's a stick there. I better pick that up, right? I better deal with that thing so that that stumbling block doesn't stay a stumbling block. And, and otherwise, we can leave it alone. Like, if I don't, like if I don't pick up Jacob, if Jacob doesn't pick up Jacob's toys— and those stumbling Legos stay stumbling Legos. It just keeps going after, you know, the same, same thing over and over until he deals with them, right? And so I think that's, that's an apt comparison. Like Jesus' death, stumbling block for these Jews, if they would just deal with that stumbling block, 
it wouldn't be one anymore. And I think that's what God's intention was. And, and some definitely caught on with it, right? There was definitely, uh, you know, Peter preached to the Jews for all of his ministry in the, in, in the first century. And, and definitely Jews came along and followed after Jesus Christ, became Christians, uh, as we find out in the book of Acts. But, man, it's, that's, that's still the same for us today. We fall over things. Let's deal with what we tripped over. And, and that's, I think that's the way that, that Jesus' death could have been dealt with, with by the Jews. And so um, I wanted to bring up another quote there that he, ta- when he's talking about verse 9, Great House said, the exclusion of the bulk of Israel is not permanent. Mm-hmm. God's punishment for its rebellion is remedial, not final. Paul expects the inclusion of the Gentiles to affect an awakening Amen. of unbelieving Israel, bringing it to a realization of what it has been missing and so to lead it to repent. Paul hopes the success of the Gentile mission will contribute in this way to the saving of some of his fellow Jews. I, I hear that, and all I can think about is some of the, the things going on in our world today. Church, um, <laughs> we, we've gotten some things wrong over the last decades and, and, and all this stuff, and I don't want to turn this into... Uh, you know, current events kind of moment, but, or, uh, you know, th- this moment is definitely that, but I read that and I see hope for those that see the world differently than maybe some of us who have been around a little too long. Um, not too long, but we've been around a long time. And, and we need to see the world differently. We need to see the world the way that God has intended us to see it. And, and it takes a new generation to do that. Right, so what Paul's saying here about you know the Gentiles are going to be a light to the Jews. This new thing that God is doing is going to be a light to to those that have thought they had it figured out. Guys, what our young people in the world are doing, what our um, these new generations are experiencing and trying to show us, that is a new light for us to grab a hold of and to see what God is doing. Or we could be in danger of being like these Jews and think oh, we've already got it all figured out. They should become like us. Oh, that's that's big, that's big, guys. I hope you, I hope you you hear that. Sorry, I don't I don't want it to go way off track, but that's no, I think that's, there's a lot of truth good. there. Yeah, we've got to we've you know kind of like what I said in in last week's um, the midweek Bible study. He said we have to be open to listening. Mm-hmm. Like we may not always agree with them, we may not always see their point of view, but we at least have to listen. Yeah. Like not just listen to respond. But to listen, to listen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Um, so let's go ahead and read um, verses 11 through 16. All right. Chapter 11, verse 11. Again, I ask, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. Rather, because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. But if their transgression means riches for the world, And their loss means riches for the Gentiles. How much greater riches will their full inclusion bring? I am talking to you Gentiles. Inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I take pride in my ministry in the hope that I may somehow arouse my own people to to envy and save some of them. For if their rejection brought reconciliation to the world, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? If the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. Mm-hmm. Oh, I, I, I literally can't read that without thinking about today's world. Yeah. Yeah. That's so good. It is. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, I love, you know, as, as, as much as I've, I've always loved Romans. It's always been one of my favorite uh, books, but to get in and to l- know really what Paul's, you know, talking about on a deeper level than just, you know, going through and reading through it, as I'm sure most of us have, is just to go through and read through. Um, but, like, man, it's just so deep, and it's so, like, we could just put today's world right on top of it. Like, <laughs> just use some of what he says in today's world right now. It's just so timeless, I guess. Yeah. Is a w- Timely, yeah. yeah. I mean, just yeah. absolutely. Re- absolutely. Um, and so... There, on in verse 11, um, 
rather because of their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel envious. And so there, and that, that envious word is an, where we're still kind of using that word zealous. And so he's, he's, he said, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make Israel zealous. So he's trying to get them to switch their zealous um, against Gentiles to their zealousy for God mm -hmm. um, in this new, you know, and he's trying to show them, like, this isn't, you thought Israel was this. Well, God has made Israel this, and you're not looking at it. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what he's, he's um going through uh, there. And um, another thing that, you know, I know we've already talked about this, but just I uh, want to bring up again, um, he's basically saying Israel's rejection of Christ led to their sa the saving death. So it's just, man, just, you know, and then he goes on, uh, but if their transgressions means riches for the world, and their loss means riches for the Gentiles. How much greater riches were their full in inclusion bring? Yeah. And so he's, you know, he's like, if their transgressions do this, and their loss, and their loss means riches for the Gentiles. Um, and he's just kind of like, imagine what their obedience and this recovery will will bring. Like he's ah. He's excited about it. I'm excited about it. Just reading it, like to think about this. Yeah. Um, it's good. And so there, that tr that dr transgression, and well, just like I said, like the, the, their disobedience, um, and their loss, uh, their loss brings this recovery to the Gentiles. Um, there, yeah. So let me uh, kind of can. Again, kind of compare this to the state of the church today. We we see we've seen over the last two decades, kind of an exodus from the church with with younger people. You know, and that's and it's not in every church, it's not in every area of the country that this is happening. But in many churches, uh, the young people are not sticking around, or what they're doing is they're going out, they're leaving their home church and going to a different church, whether it's the same denomination, different on whatever, but a different church because they feel like that church is speaking their language that's that church is 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 working in a way that makes sense to them in the way that they see the world now amen so this they may not be angry with their home church but they definitely have lost a sense of belonging to their home church and so to equate that to this as the home church loses sight of what god is doing in the world today people leave that church their law, like that, the loss of that church is still somebody else's gain. Those people are are going somewhere where they can be a part of something that God is doing in the world. Imagine if then, I mean, so that's good. So that it's gain there. Like there's there really is something. There's a recovery for those people, as to use the phrase of this verse. Imagine what the fullness of that would be. How awesome that would be if if those who are are fighting against changes would just fully include themselves in what God is doing in the world today. Imagine how the fullness of the church would be. Like that's that's good. I, I hope I'm not taking this away from where you were trying to go. No. But that just I can't get it out of my head. Just reading it the first time and then as you bring this up again, like we are seeing this division that is working out well for the people that have left. And, and, and we're not having the full inclusion of our church family for the, for the wholeness of the church. And imagine if, if those of us who, who have led a lot of our lives, right, and I, those that are, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80 years old, and you've done a, a exemplary, fantastic, amazing service for the kingdom of God, and yet we're kind of stuck in our ways and we don't, we don't let someone else or a group of someone else kind of show us a new way mm -hmm. so that we can have a full inclusion of the church. So. Yeah. Well, and that kind of leads to, as I told you, I read, uh, I finished that book, Canoeing the Mountains, and he's kind of talking about how 
um, you know, pastors, when they, they come out of seminary, they've got all these, uh, these teachings, and as they come in, like some of the times, their churches aren't going to look like the churches would in seminary. And so they kind of like got to think outside the box. And he brings that up um, in the, towards the end of the, the book. Um, he said that we see a decline in the church. Right now we're seeing this decline in the church. And he said, um, you know, as we, as we look at this, we don't. We shouldn't bring to to the table these things that we've done before. Mm -hmm. These older ideas that aren't obviously aren't working. He said we've got to think outside the box. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the uh, for those of you guys that aren't familiar with it, the whole idea of canoeing the mountains is the. It's based on the the story of Lewis and Clark. Mm -hmm. As they came, they thought they were going to have these these waterways and that's what they were going to do little did they know they were facing the mountains and so they've got canoes and they don't have horses and they don't know what they're doing or where they're going um, but what they do is they get rid of the canoes they get horses they figure out how to to go through the terrain and so it's just this this you know he said, this is what we need to do. We can't use our canoes in the mountains anymore. Like, we're in the mountains. We've got to face it. And we've got to think of some out, outside-of-the-box things. And we've got to be okay with people that are kind of thinking this outside-the-box. And as long as, you know, it's not... And I know, of course, we're, you know, you can get too far <laughs> outside the box. But, you know, as long as it's fitting in with our, our, our mission... And, you know, it's not against anything in the Bible. And, like, I think we've got to discern this, not just shut it down because it's new. But we've got to honestly listen, to listen, not just to say, no, that's a horrible idea that would never work. We've got to, like, actually think about it, actually pray about it. Yeah. And, w and what the beauty of what this is talking about and the hope that we have is that as, as those who have were once the ones thinking outside the box, the ones that were are now getting to a point where, okay, now we've got to let someone else do the thinking, let someone else do the leading. We all stay included in that, right? Mm -hmm. And so what ends up happening now is that people grab or hold on to what they've always controlled, and that pushes someone else away. And if we would we would turn over those reins to somebody else, we would stay included in that process, and we would bring something to the table. Like that's that's what I think the, the the truth of this is is that when we allow for the new things of God, because God, while he was while he is um, always the same, he's not changing. He is still revealing new things as our world changes, right? Like so, the way that we deal with things has to change. And so, uh, if we would be open and honest about uh, that that reality, there would be inclusion for everybody. Well, and so that's, you know, there in, in 12, um, he talks about their full inclusion, um, how much greater riches will their full inclusion bring. And so it's that, that fullness of Israel there. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, in, when we talk about the fullness of Israel, we're talking about leaving Jews and Gentiles. Um, so kind of to take it back there, um, the elect. So the justified believers, um, Jews and Gentiles, into this one messianic community. Yeah. yeah. That's good. The fullness of Israel. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's good. And we can add to that every day. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, there in 13 and 14, those two verses, he says, I'm talking to you Gentiles. So he kind of directs this, um, you know, he's taught in say, I'm talking to you Gentiles. Um, chin, you know, and just <laughs> get their attention. <laughs> yeah, and he he talks about uh, being an apostle to the Gentiles and how he hopes he will arouse some of the Jews to make them zealous, so in these, so that they will be saved. And um, he said that it's to fulfill um, the scriptures in Deuteronomy 32, 21, which was quoted in Romans 10, 19, um, there are 10, 19, and, and I ask again, does Israel not understand? First Moses says, uh, it, I will make you envious by those who are not a nation. 
I will make you angry by a nation that has no understanding. And of course, we talked um, a few weeks ago that that meant like the Gentiles. That's what he's he's saying there. Um, and so another thing I wanted to point out in those in verse 14 is um, I just thought it was kind of it pointed out in the commentary and I'd never seen it. And I wanted to point it out. Uh, he says that I may arouse my own people t- to envy and save some of them. I, he just, he doesn't go save all of them. I have pie in the sky kind of expectations. He's just saying, I want to do this just to save some, like just to get a few more. Like that's like, to me, I'm just like, wow. Like I've never noticed that, that he says that, to save some. Kind of heartbreaking to think about that, like, and that's just taking the words of Jesus to heart. You know, the, the narrow is the road, and only a few will find it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's really true. I, and I, I kind of, you know, when he takes that moment to say, "Okay, Gentiles, I'm talking to you." It's like he's a, he turns into this, you know, uh, coach, and he's giving him a pep talk, and he's like, "I need you guys here, okay? Come on, let's get this right, so that my brothers and sisters, like, you're my brothers and sisters in Christ." And that's real, and that's true, and and we're close. But I've got these blood relatives. I've got these people that I've grown up with and and loved for many years. I've got them still back there, and I need you guys to help me get them. And I think that just that I, I think about my own family and some of those things, and I think about you know just the people that I've grown up with, and and the, the the truth that people that we talked about one before we started recording here that you know there are people that we know that have followed Jesus Christ and have walked away. Right. And so we need each other to live out the life of Christ so that some of these people might see it and some might be saved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just. I mean, I just keep thinking, you know, it's almost like like (laughs) like God taking a hold of you. You know, you brought it up like Paul taking a hold of Mm -hmm. the chin. Um, It's almost like God saying, hey, I need you to the Mm -hmm. church, to us saying, I need you to act the way you're supposed to yeah. act. Amen, amen. To bring some in. Yeah. Like, in, as you said, like, Paul would say, you know, these are my, my blood relatives. Like, man, I wish that people that were around my blood relatives that weren't Christians, um, I wish people that were Christians around them would act so much like Christians. Act like Christ. Yeah. Yeah. Would act like Christ the way that we are supposed to, um, to bring them in. Man, yeah. just Absolutely. that thought there. Um, and then kind of to finish out, um, for their, in there in 15, for their rejection brought reconciliation to the world. What will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Yeah. Um, and I just, I love that reconciliation to the world um and it more reckon i want to point out there it was more than just a reconciliation between the jews and the gentiles he says a reconciliation to the world like we're not just talking about two groups of people that you know were fighting even as he's talking about in this letter but this reconciliation to the world Amen. And then um, there in 16, um, and he says, if part of the dough offered as the first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, uh, so are the branches. And he kind of brings up this um, scripture that I had um, marked earlier um, from Numbers 15. Uh, so it's verses... So Numbers 15, verses 17 through 21, where uh, there it says, The Lord said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, When you enter the land to which I am taking you, you will eat the food of the land. Present a portion as an offering to the Lord. Present a loaf from the first of your ground meal and present it as an offering from the threshing floor. Uh, throughout the generations to come, you are you are to give this offering to the Lord from the first of your ground meal. And so from doing that, from giving of the first, um, the holiness of the first fruits, 
ensured the entire batch would be holy. Yeah, and that's, you know, and let me look it up to make sure I, I say this correctly. But there in verse 16, so if the part of the dough offered as first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. If the root is holy, so are the branches. And he's going to get into verse 17 here where, mm-hmm. where the branches are these Gentiles getting grafted in. So if the b- Gentiles want to be holy, the roots have to be And the roots are, j- the Jews are part of like that. God wants both to be together to form one holiness thing, this tree, this branch, whatever you want to use there. But the we need Jesus and we don't get Jesus without the Jews. That's what the whole Old Testament is about. The Jews were supposed to bring Jesus, not Jesus but at that time, but to bring the message of God to the world around them, right? And so now us grafted in, as we're going to look at next week, it is now on us to be holy so that we can continue to make other people that get grafted in holy as well. Mm-hmm. It's on us to stay holy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Can't, you can't keep going on that without then busting into what next week's going to be about. I know, so. <laughs> I know. I was like, this is such a hard break, but we have to. Otherwise, yep. we're going to have to go really, really long. <laughs> yep. So, Anybody still um, watching out there? Tell, <laughs> just tell us yes if you're still watching right now on the video. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, so it's, we're kind of leaving on the cliffhanger. That's all right. So That's all right. You have to turn in, tune in next week now to yep. finish this up. So Good. to see what exactly Paul's talking about. What is he talking about when he's talking about roots and branches and all that? So, yeah, you got to tune in next week now. Okay. All right. <laughs> Why don't you close us out in prayer? Okay. Lord, we just we just thank you that you have given this opportunity, this this fullness, this reconciliation. Um, to the whole world, and we just are so grateful that in in your plan that you brought us in and we can p- be part of these justified believers, the select. Lord, I just thank you for that. I just thank you that you have the perfect plan in all situations. And Lord, I just, I just pray that you just continue to help mold us, um, the clay that we are, and mold our hearts and Lord, I just pray that you help us through these areas of growth that we need, uh, that you just help and guide us. Uh, Lord, I just thank you for this. I thank you for this evening. I thank you for this Bible study. I'm just so grateful that we are able to dig into your word and to learn more about you and that you reveal yourself through the word. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.